Welcome to Librarian's Choice, a podcast of the Winter Park Library. Hey y'all, I'm Rachel Simmons, your friendly neighborhood archivist here at the Winter Park Library, and I am your host for this episode of Librarian's Choice. This time we'll be talking about The Revolutionary Samuel Adams by Stacey Schiff, and with me today are three of my colleagues, so you guys... Do you introduce yourself? Hey, I'm Jeremy Zorn, one of the public services librarians here at the Winter Park Library. I'm Ann Simpson, the other public services librarian. And I'm Michaela Miller, the community outreach librarian. And before we start our discussion today, we would love for you to join us at the following Winter Park Library events. From Gullah to Juneteenth, on June 20th, which is a Tuesday, featuring the story of the blues, Sweetgrass, Basket Weaving, and The Path to Juneteenth, as well as Speak from the Heart on June 24th and our second annual Maker Day on July 6th. Be sure to join us for those wonderful and fun events. So the revolutionary Samuel Adams is one of six books written by Stacy Schiff. Now she won a Pulitzer Prize back in 1995 along with She's actually gotten quite a few literary awards, ranging from uh, 1996 all the way to 2019. And um, interesting for our application, considering that we are talking about Samuel Adams, one of those literary awards, aside from the vaunted Pulitzer Prize, obviously, is the New England Historic Genealogical Society Lifetime Achievement Award in History and Biography. Good Lord, that is a mouthful. Um, but that to me is kind of interesting. And I think she won that for, uh, the witches, which was about, uh, the Salem witch trials. I want to read that one next. Cause I, uh, I, I do have some critiques for this book, but I, I did enjoy reading it. Um, but to just quickly summarize what the book is about, it pretty much is exactly what it says on the tin. It is the revolutionary Samuel Adams. It is a biography of Samuel Adams. Um, so my first question to you guys is, what did you guys think of the book? And the, the way we're going to structure this, just for folks at home, we're going to structure this kind of as a discussion of things we really, really liked about the book and the things we didn't like the book. So basically pros and critiques, essentially. So Jeremy, you want to start? Uh, sure, yeah. So um, looking at this as a popular book, a book that was, you know, a New York Times bestseller even, um, I was kind of approaching it as very much, well, this seems like it'll be a book for a lay person audience, you know. And it is, yeah. Yeah, so in that, uh, you know, sense, I was kind of reading it um, as this is something maybe that should be a primer about Samuel Adams, you know, the person and the time period and the revolutionary events. So, um, yeah, as a primer, it definitely had its merits and took you through, you know, a time period and a lot of things that might be familiar to you from, you know, your U.S. history class from eighth grade or whenever you took that um, with a little bit more behind the scenes detail and such. But at the same time I was reading it, I was kind of thinking like, why Samuel Adams? Like, is she really that committed to him? It seems like as with a lot of historical figures, it can be a bit difficult to, um, you know, have a lot of blanks filled in the life of that person. Mm -hmm. Um, So like reading about, you know, his biography, well, you have like his marriage and family life and you get really I don't know maybe a paragraph or two throughout the whole book of that stuff you know um and there's a lot of kind of self-consciousness from the author about not having a lot of details about Samuel Adams you know the person's life um so I don't know I just kept kind of thinking that in the back of my head why Samuel Adams um I don't really feel that much more engaged reading about the revolution and the events through his life than maybe I would through a history textbook. Right, right. I'd say really this was about as dry, if at times not drier than some textbooks that I've read. Ooh, ooh, that's a spicy take. (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, um, I was easily distracted while I was reading it, which I think is not a great compliment, you Mm -hmm. know, to my experience of the book. Okay. Um, but probably could draw some more thoughts from there. But okay. Uh, we'll come back around. What about you, Anne? 
I didn't finish it. <laughs> That's fair. Um, I tried like four or five different times to start this book. I re- did it as an ebook. I did it as an audio book. I tried so hard and I couldn't do it. Um, uh, like Jeremy, I my attention wandered a lot while trying to read it, and uh, I would be like, "I had come on, you can do it. Just listen to the, it's like a podcast. Just do it while you do your chores." And then the Vanderpump Rules thing happened. <laughs> And I couldn't get a, like, that consumed everything, and there was no space for Samuel Adams, and then um, the new Breath of the Wild game came out, and there's been no space for anything. Of course, of course. <laughs> so, maybe I'm not a good book club member, but I did try. Um, I thought it was well written, and I liked the narrator for the audiobook's voice a lot. Like, I oh, would, yeah. I would listen to more things that he's done, I could listen to sure. that man read the phone book, were and I did. All, um, were, were you all, um... Audiobook on this one? So, I was. So, oh, oh, that actually, that's a really interesting question. So, all... And you listen to him read the phone book? Yeah. So I would listen to him read the phone book, yeah. Um, there well, are a lot of people... You did listen to him read the phone this, book. This could be like reading the phone oh, book okay. at times. Um, but, so you guys, Anne and Michaela, you both did the mm-hmm. audiobook. Yeah. Jeremy, you read the physical copy. Yeah. I actually did both the audiobook and... The physical book. So here is how I actually structured how I read this because a long time ago I learned that I actually liked books on tape as a child Mm -hmm. and instead of fighting that and just growing out of it, I decided to lean into it for this book because I realized that I might get distracted, but if I had sound coming in, I wouldn't get distracted. I could concentrate. And so I actually leaned into those books on tape that I used as a kid and actually both physically read the physical book and used the audio book to supplement and to keep my my attention span going. And that, I think, was both a detriment uh, and a boon at mm-hmm. the same time because I figured out that I read way faster <laughs> than the Actual, mm. than the actual narrator, so I would start getting confused and have still have to go back. But um, for folks that at home that really are having a hard time getting into reading, I do actually recommend using the audiobook with the physical copy or a text copy, even if it's digital. That might actually help you. Um, but also remember that Libby has speed up mechanics and I forgot about that and that's my fault. I was um, going to ask. Mm-hmm. Was yeah, like, that was yeah, my fault because I, t- one I, I completely, I, I, st- I listened to it on the original speed, oh, no. which is my problem. Like that was my fault. Mm-hmm. See, do y'all get f- uh, footnotes on the audio version? Yes. Okay. So the, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. So all of the footnotes mm-hmm. that are listed in the book, so which are really which is a really odd application for footnotes because I'm coming from the academic area where right. footnotes are pretty much, they're, they're citations. Mm-hmm. But Stacy Schiff uses them in kind of an interesting way in that she uses them as narrative asides mm-hmm. rather than as a citation. I Like I said, I, I prefer citation, but... She's got her endnotes, too, which and she's got the en- all kinds of further asides. Right, too. right. But that's, you know... A certain level of interest, right? I suppose, yeah, or, you know. And yeah. I did not. I actually did not read those. Um, but going on, so Michaela, what did you think about the book? Um, so I treated it as a marathon. I started on Friday and ended this morning. Okay, fair. So um, I no judgment. No judgment. No judgment. I get things done when I need to. Um, fair. <laughs> I thought it was good, and I think I could have only done it in the audiobook form, like we're speaking about. I did it on I 1.5 to 1.25, so a little bit faster than normal. I think the normal speed for this audiobook was actually set to 0.9, so it was mm-hmm. even slower than the normal audiobook. Um, so speeding it up was definitely key. Um, but I really enjoyed that I could pick out words at certain times and relate them back to experiences. So my first example of that, which is going to sound ridiculous, but um, you know the Liberty Tree Restaurant at Disney? Yes. (laughs) So I never knew what that was. I mean, I'm sure I learned about it sometime in elementary school, but I quickly forgot about it. So 
going back to that kind of made me more interested to listen to it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I enjoyed that. And then there were little aspects like that throughout the entire book that I thought kept my attention. Yeah. Um, And specifically in audio format, kept my attention better than it would have had I read the physical book. Yeah. Um, So I didn't find it too dry. I did find it hard to put together with all of the narrative prose, kind of like listening to poetry. At some points, that was too much. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm sure I missed stuff in in those instances. Um, But then I was also drawn back by certain different words of the time. So when they brought up different propaganda methods, when they brought up the term slavery, when they brought up um, just different characters that I had heard in the background but not really had too much experience with because Mm -hmm. I I know I learned about this in elementary school, right? But I, it's been so long. It's been a very long time. And I really just remember the highlights. (laughs) So remembering it, especially from like the Boston side of things, I feel like I remember it more from the New York side of things and the George Washington side of things. Um, so like DC. That's usually how it's framed. Yeah, that's usually how it's framed. So it was kind of a different perspective and made me see Boston as more of the main contributor, which I think is one of the main points of the biography. Boston would be so offended. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, Boston. Boston. I'm sure you're great and very patriotic. Uh, uh, I'm from Alabama. I got a dog in this fight. (laughs) The term patriotic is also what I thought was interesting, how it was used so differently throughout the entire book. So also very little Mm -hmm. in comparison to a lot of other books Mm -hmm. that are like, yay, we're 4th of July flavored. Um. (laughs) But also Samuel Adams creating that language. The very Mm -hmm. term patriot is cited as something, you know, in one of his newspaper pieces that he is now at a certain point in 17. It was always hard to keep track of what date she's talking about, which Mm -hmm. bugged me too. I never Mm -hmm. know if it's 68, 69. Like when you say, um, you know, August 7th, can't you just say 1769 or whatever Mm -hmm. year you're in? Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that would have definitely helped because you do you do see where she bumps around mm-hmm. a whole lot. She yeah. also does, uh, and, and granted, I understand why she does this. Um, and I was able to follow it, but again, I, I had the audiobook kind of helping me along in that regard sure. because there's just a lot of things that come through audio that don't necessarily come through text. Mm-hmm. So when she's referring back to a uh, an earlier point, mm-hmm. usually the land uh, the land bank scandal. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something that she refers to back a lot, but doesn't necessarily you don't necessarily see that in the text, but if you, you can hear it in mm-hmm. audio, mm-hmm. so that it's like uh, audio that audio text combo. I'm telling you guys, it's a secret weapon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just speed it up. <laughs> the only part that that was my downfall on was the fact that she was he kept the author kept referencing forward and backward, Mm -hmm. and then saying his wife's name. But his wife, he has two wives, and they're both named Elizabeth. And that threw me off so hard because I was like, I thought Elizabeth died. She died. What's going on? Why is she alive again? (laughs) Yeah. And she said, Betsy is the second one. Yeah, but I just, you know, that's that's a nickname for For Elizabeth. Elizabeth. So I was like, well, maybe they're just calling her something different now. I don't know. No, no, no. Figured it out eventually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Anyways, all that was just to your point before Michaela saying, uh, you know, whatever year such and such newspaper piece is coming out, you know, uh, he is uh, so instrumental in coining a lot of the language that we think of. So even that word patriot at such and such a time, he uses to apply to, you know, the anti-British cause. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want to call it, I I guess the cause of the rebellion, you know, at that point, Mm -hmm. that's what it is. Um, It takes a while for it to become a revolution and, you know, nobody's really speaking explicitly about breaking away for quite some time. But at a certain point, I forget if it was after the Boston Massacre or when, he starts using patriot in that way. And there are Mm -hmm. a number of other examples of terminology that's familiar to us Mm -hmm. that I think Schiff wants to kind of nudge us and say, hey, Samuel Adams kind of affected this, you know, change. So, what, you got any further thoughts? I have one further thought. Yeah, go ahead. And I'm sure you guys had the same thought, too, because as I was listening to the part where they describe the accent of Boston, Mm -hmm. how were you guys picturing that? Because I was picturing a full-on Boston accent, Mm -mm, but I could not picture that with Mm -hmm. colonial time period. So, Boston's (laughs) accent, and the only reason I know this is because... I had to study this uh, in school, is 
it was not terribly dissimilar to a, what we would consider a British accent today, mm -hmm. but it was slower. So it's weird because that Bostonian accent would then trickle down and become the Virginian accent, and mm -hmm. that variation then would become a Georgian variation, and then would become, and it would actually like spread mm -hmm. throughout the South, and but it, it would also slower spread and slower all the way down. Not necessarily. <laughs> no. The inflections change depending on the population that lives in that area. So. For example, there's a lot of Scotch-Irish throughout the South, so their accent then merges with the Virginian version of that Boston accent, and mm -hmm. then it kind of blends in into its own new thing, which becomes the Appalachian accent, which becomes... Yeah, it just... it, it It's really fascinating. Speech evolution. Yeah, it is really speech cool. evolution. Yeah. But, that, but that's what's really cool, is that Bostonians in 1776 do not sound like Bostonians of today. They mm -hmm. just don't. And that's something that... A lot of people don't necessarily realize how fast language can change, mm -hmm. um, and it's and yeah, that that is something I actually really did enjoy. I that part really, of it, yeah, yeah it, it was really it was like really that. interesting to know, yeah. uh, uh, like when they described how the R's were already being dropped. Uh huh. Um, that in particular, it's like there's no way I can picture someone dressed like that using <laughs> using that accent. Are they yeah. in the audiobook? Are you hearing these accents? No, no. but, oh. you but can, she's described, yeah. she describes yeah. it in yeah. one section of the book. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they, I, they, they are. Done an accent. <laughs> that would have been, really been funny. Fun. Yeah. Oh, that would have not. I honestly don't even think it would have been funny. I think it would have been fascinating mm -hmm. to hear this read mm -hmm. in an accent. Oh, not the whole thing. Um, <laughs> like, I, I, I actually think it would have been cool. But that's kind of like... It's kind of similar to how people don't realize that Shakespeare didn't sound quite the same way. Mm -hmm. That he he sounded like during uh, Elizabeth Elizabethan England, it would have he would have sounded more like a pirate, mm -hmm. <laughs> like what we would think of as a pirate. Yeah. So that's what's kind of cool about that is mm -hmm. that, and I am kind of, and I'm really glad that she brought that up because mm -hmm. that is actually really cool. Well, it's one of those things that kind of got me more seated in the book, you right. know, able to listen to it because I was able to picture. Because mm. obviously, it's hard to pick, picture yeah. colonial times, yeah. especially when you're living in Florida. Mm -hmm. It's History is here, but it, you have to look right. for it. And the, so, yeah. And one thing I don't also want to bring up, you're, you're mentioning of the Liberty Tree and mm -hmm. the Liberty Tree restaurant in, uh, or Liberty Tree Tavern in Disney World. Uh -huh. um, most people do not actually know that the Liberty Tree was, a, in fact, a mm -hmm. real tree. Because it's like, oh, the Tree of Liberty is watered with the blood of tyrants. Most people only think of it as a metaphor because we really don't want to talk about the effigies that were yeah, hung up there serious in a pretty violent manner, mm -hmm. um, which is what bothered Thomas Hutchinson. And to mm -hmm. be fair, I'd be probably pretty bothered, too, if I was hung in effigy. Yeah. Thomas like, Hutchinson. yeah, they were of Thomas <laughs> Hutchinson. That was pretty scary because mm -hmm. uh, the, the further threat is... Make it like it like keep on going. We'll make it worse, and mm -hmm. <laughs> that's kind of we we don't typically teach that in in the history classrooms. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, it's interesting too reading the book how open and tolerant the society is for you know like the white male revolutionaries who right. are able you know to print in these newspapers you know to hang these mm -hmm. effigies with very little consequence. Right. Like blaming know? it on schoolboys. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know. I was, I and um and it's just too. yeah and and there's a quote uh towards the end of the book where someone is critiquing um I did find this page. Oh go ahead. Um you know how, listen, they're saying like, in the finest climate, under the mildest government, blessed with land and religious liberty, protected by the greatest power on earth, that you could viciously defy a parent state that had nursed your tender years. <laughs> you know, someone is almost making fun of the revolutionary or just speaking kind of from a place of bewilderment mm -hmm. that you all would be the one to, you know, uh, lead this revolution and overthrow uh, the British, like the spoiled children, you know. Mm -hmm. And Adams, it says, Samuel Adams uh, uh, had one word at his disposal to defend himself against this charge. Liberty and, and 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 Sam Adams would definitely be leaning into the microphone and blaring out the speaker when when doing that. Mm -hmm. uh. And if, and again, so much of the construction of our language and these kind of American, you know, American ideas. Isms. Yeah, um, uh, liberty, patriot. You know, these mm -hmm. words. Um, uh, they're connotation and meaning isn't taken for yeah. granted back then quite mm -hmm. the same way as now. They're being coined, almost, those terms. You know? And I actually, uh, when 
going back to your point about, you know, the not entirely sure why Samuel Adams. I, mm-hmm. I, I think I, I think I do. It's because the challenge. Um, yeah. Because he is one of the founding fathers that is the hardest to track down because he he was the secret agent. He mm-hmm. was the guy that, no, like, everybody knew about him, but nobody knew exactly what he was doing. But they knew he was stirring the pot, but he was stirring the pot behind a screen. Mm-hmm. And so that, and, and he intentionally destroyed most of his communications. Yeah. Not, not only to keep him and his family safe, but also to keep the British from going, being able to have evidence to go after his friends. Not great for a biographer. Which is horrible. <laughs> when, when actually, Stacey Ship points that out. That's, that's one of the reasons why I, I would, I don't blame her for feeling preoccupied with saying, now we don't know, mm-hmm. because we don't. I mean, that's, that's a statement of fact, is yeah. we just simply don't know. And, you know, because one of the, there, there's a few framing devices in this book, and one of them is trying to fill in the gaps, like trying to figure out Samuel Adams's brain. And the thing about it is, is that was he always a revolutionary? Mm-hmm. Did he, did he, as he said later, come around to the revolution a little bit later? Mm-hmm. Whereas everybody else is like, oh no, he had revolution in his brain the entire time. And mm-hmm. Sam Adams is going... No, I didn't. Like, no, I think Schiff makes the claim that, like, psychologically at least, he was always kind of predisposed to be a revolutionary. That's that. Mm-hmm. She, that she does make that point, but yeah. Sam Adams himself, like, the, what we what we do know is yeah. that he's like, I I came around to this. I think it was like seventeen sixty eight. Yeah, or he's something in his forties, like and yeah. she says that. But she goes back to his uh, college years at Harvard, mm-hmm. and that's one of my favorite parts of the book. I think early on, because it's actual feels like biography, mm-hmm. and then the end, once the war is going in motion, again, finally it feels like biography. So as an right. aside, I did like those parts. But she talks about him as a student, um, and you know his interests in like political philosophy, and you know kind of the Greco Roman lineage, and then more modern. And types mm-hmm. like John Locke. Mm-hmm. And it has, someone says that quote, um, I, I can't remember who, but the revolutionary was formed really mm-hmm. in the library of Harvard University. Yeah. Right. You know, and you have, uh, you know, bits where like she's talking about what were exemplary um, theses mm-hmm. or what are, what are examples rather of a typical thesis at Harvard, you know, like yeah. at this time period. And there's a lot of stuff about like, did angels exist? Right. Yeah. Like, and and mm-hmm. he goes for the political philosophy, this kind of like liberty oriented thing from right. the get go. So yeah. to answer your question. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, I do agree that he was definitely predisposed to that, but that's also something that that's one of the framing devices. The other framing device, which I think is much weaker uh, to your point is uh, in the middle of the book, the it, it sort of gets framed as a tug of war between, and it always gets framed as this because it is, but it's a tug of war between the colonies and the British. Mm-hmm. And the way Stacy Schiff specifically frames this is to, uh, Sam, Sam Adams versus Thomas Hutchinson. Mm-hmm. Specifically Thomas Hutchinson. Yeah, Bernard is hanging around, knocking mm-hmm. around in the background on occasion, but he mostly gets shoved to the side. And it's basically the revolution is framed as a battle between these two dudes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I find that to be a little weaker um, just because there is so much going on mm-hmm. that contributes to the revolutionary fervor in Boston and throughout the colonies, mm-hmm. that it, it is not just these two dudes, even though Sam Adams is definitely a major player. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously Thomas Hutchinson would have also been a major player, but I still feel like that weakens the book to a certain extent. I did think she acknowledged that other people within Boston, and especially at first in the outskirts, like a rounding, right. were not on his cause. Mm-hmm. Um, and I appreciated that because that's something that I feel like history kind of glosses over that People are probably really afraid, right, to, to well, stand up afraid. for one thing or the other. They were afraid, and a lot of folks, especially, like, when you go back and actually read through, uh, specifically, you know, Tory mm-hmm. thought, which Tory, just for my audience out there, that means they sided with the British. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, there were col- colonists that sided with the British. It's not it's not all Johnny Tremaine now. <laughs> um, the, the Redcoats didn't just show up and we were surprised, you know. <laughs> But no, it it's more like 
people were baffled, just like uh, the the quote that Jeremy had earlier. Mm -hmm. People were utterly baffled, like, where did this come from? Mm -hmm. Like, it happens quickly. It happens you know, really the book, fast. Really, the events yeah. take place in the mid '60s, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, of the 18th century. And honestly, I think that the reli like not religious, sorry, revolutionary fervor gets really kicked up when Gage and his guys, the the regulars, land. Mm -hmm. And these are not well-trained soldiers. We, we tend to mm -hmm. like to think of them as, uh, like, and, and, and to a certain extent it is, but we think of Big Britain versus Tiny America mm -hmm. at this point. And that's always how it's framed. But the, Brit the average British soldier is... Young. It, not, not only are they young, they're usually dumb. They're but they're rowdy. <laughs> they're 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 young, dumb, and rowdy. Mm -hmm. And then you bring them to a foreign place that they do not know the societal rules for, and they've been given power. What do you think they're going to do with it? They're going to start breaking <clears throat> stuff, and that's exactly and what they do. This terrifying journey to get yeah. there. Right? I mean, thinking yeah. about, you know, travel over the ocean in <laughs> yeah. that time period. And We're that's sympathizers, you guys. Well, and, and that's <laughs> Are we Tories? So. Yeah. But that's <laughs> the thing you have to take into <laughs> account is that these are, are people that they have been, and sometimes they're conscripted too. So mm -hmm. sometimes we're not working with, like, like the greatest that mm -hmm. the British military we're not they're not all officers they're not all regimented some of these guys are conscripts some of these guys are just dumb kids down on their luck you know the and I think they said the 29th regiment like the one that was involved right. was people that were in prison right yeah, like yeah, that that, that is what they had mentioned yeah they're conscripts yeah, yeah. and and we're not we're, in other words we're we're working with people that are likely going to get rowdy anyways and the thing is, is that, and I do like the fact that Stacy Schiff, this is one of my, uh, like, pros of the book, is the fact that Stacy Schiff acknowledges that Samuel Adams blows out of proportion a lot of the stuff these mm -hmm. guys do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that they still were doing really awful things to the colonists, and this is what, that's the actual powder keg, mm -hmm. is... is these guys do not know how to behave themselves. They do not know how to comport themselves. And that is, in fact, the actual problem that Samuel Adams then uses his new propaganda machine mm -hmm. to take advantage of. And not let people forget. And not incidents. let people forget. Or taking what was something that is, you know, was an actual problem and then making it either into an entirely different problem, see the Boston Massacre, mm -hmm. or creating, like, basically taking a bunch of different small stories, like, mm -hmm. oh, this soldier broke into a lady's house and, like, stole a piece of clothing, mm -hmm. or something like, first off, mm -hmm. weird, what are you going to be doing with it? But mm -hmm. second, it's like, okay, he broke into her house and stole a piece of clothing, and then this turns into, he raped the wife shot the children and burned down the house, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it, it, it then, it just twists into this something that, that, like, is related tangentially to the thing that actually happened, but it becomes this completely other, more extreme thing. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is the thing that Stacey, the actual question, I think, that Stacey Schiff is asking throughout the book is, why did he do that? Mm -hmm. Like, wh where did that come from? And that is, uh... That is the question that I think she fails to answer, but she tells us she's going to fail in answering that hmm. because there is just not enough documentation. That's in, the, in other words, that's not a knock against her. There's just simply not enough documentation mm -hmm. to figure mm -hmm. out what his deal was. Um, well, it from, left me wondering if all of the stories were necessarily true, to be honest, right? Because and that's that's entirely possible that they're yeah. not. Uh, it just seemed like they came up very, at very convenient times, and they could have been true. I'm sure they were true in some instances, but... Can you give us an example? <sighs> let me... Can you, can you think? Let me think really quick. Um, I think about... Uh, that'll take me a second. Okay. I had it this, like, this morning when I was listening <laughs> to it. Um, I think that the things, like, always having the 
fife and drum playing on Sundays, right? I'm sure right. that that stuff, just because that's stuff people do to annoy each other, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> They're trying to be annoying neighbors. Like, I don't know um, if you guys have ever heard of fife, but it is one of the most ear-screeching noises you will ever hear. Mm-hmm. Like, it's basically a piccolo, mm-hmm. and my old band director would say, how do you get two piccolos to be in tune with each other? You shoot one of them. Um, <laughs> oh, and that's exactly what a fife sounds like. Mm-hmm. It is ear piercing. Go ahead. It's just... <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> um, I just thought that it... With the fact that they had these five newspapers at their disposal and that they were spreading these messages so far and wide to people who can't even picture the city of Boston, right? right? Um, so it it seems to me that it had to be a pretty wide narrative mm-hmm. that they were that they were telling. Right. Um, at least from my perspective, that <laughs> that's how I saw it. Well, I felt very bad for the people who like were getting blamed for everything and everything and everything. Mm-hmm. Even if they they may have, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know enough about that. But and I think like that was the one thing that kind of struck me is that Thomas Hutchinson's worst sin was being bad at his job. Hmm. Yeah, that was his worst sin. Is he was bad at his job, and that is actually to kind of Samuel Adams's credit is he's like, yeah, uh, this whole, like, landed gentry thing and Mm -hmm. people just getting, like, all these, as we would call it today, Nepo babies, getting, (laughs) basically just Mm -hmm. getting a round robin of, you know, perks and job opportunities, that doesn't make them good at their job, and Thomas Hutchinson got banished because he was so bad at his. And then one of the revolutionaries, I think it was a warden, Mm -hmm. I think, uh, bought his house. Yeah, that was adding insult to injury. That was a glorious cherry on top of that. I've just like. But I also noted that (laughs) I feel like Samuel Adams just always quit while he was slightly ahead at Mm -hmm. being bad at his jobs. Like he was good at politics, but it was very hard for me to picture a man being influential who wasn't actually good at business or in any sort of like monetary standing, right? Right. Yeah, that, that's a, a big part of, you know, her story there is that our hero is bad at his job. Yeah. And that his passion, you know, is not for business, you know. I guess the brewing business, which right. now mm-hmm. has come back in his name. Okay. But, <laughs> yeah, this is actually something I wanted to talk uh, about, too, yeah. because, um, the, and this is something that Stacy Schiff, and this is my biggest critique of her book, hmm. is absolutely guilty of. And the thing is, is that not only is she guilty of it, but every single person who writes about the Revolutionary War is guilty of this bar none is the fact that we always because of the framing Mm -hmm. that big big aristocratic britain versus plain tiny little colonial america because of that conflict because of the way that is usually framed that means that our founding fathers also have to be framed as normal people Mm-hmm. When they're not, right? Yeah, and and I don't and I don't mean that as an insult. I mean that as Samuel Adams went to Harvard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> His when he was dad 14, went to Harvard. Right? His son went yeah, to Harvard. What is up with that? And they were, they were high <laughs> in the hierarchy of, Har- of Harvard. And she talks about the way in They're which... They're judges. Mm-hmm. Like, his Samuel, Samuel Adams uh, Sr., so, by the way, that our Samuel Adams, the one that we're talking about, is actually Samuel Adams Jr. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the previous Sam Adams was a judge. And mm-hmm. so, that's the thing, is that... Um, or he was a high lawyer. I can't mm-hmm. remember, like, mm-hmm. which one. Mm-hmm. But that's the thing, is that these people are people of power and influence and wealth. Mm-hmm. It's part of why Schiff celebrates him as a hero, though, and his inability to manage a business and run it into the ground right. and live, you know, with more humility in many ways, you know, than the others. And to have, like, when the war's begun, right. Betsy uh, Adams is the only one of these wives of the founding fathers, of these delegates <laughs> who works to support herself, mm-hmm. you know, and that kind of thing. And, and that's kind of heroic, it seems, to Schiff. And this idea of someone who commits himself to politics. This is the only Mm -hmm. profession he's cut out for, is politics. And nowadays... Well, no propaganda. Right. (laughs) But nowadays you think of politics and propaganda Mm -hmm. as a... uh, occupation for very well-to-do people. Right. And so here it is, okay, this this guy who kind of almost um, wears relative, you know, Poverty, or at least his, at least his riches to yeah. relative rag status. But see, you know, as that, a that's what I'm talking about. Is he doesn't that that's not the trajectory that actually is going on. Mm-hmm. So Stacy Schiff in the early parts of the book, and this was something that I noted because it bugged the crap out of me. 
um, is his meager 90 pounds a year salary. Mm -hmm. she, she constantly harps on that throughout the book, the 90 pounds a year salary. Now, the thing is, is that figuring out average salaries in colonial U.S. is a nightmare. The reason it's a nightmare is because even though the currency is pound sterling, every single colony defines that differently. Mm -hmm. So for one colony, you may need 25 shillings to make a pound. In another colony, you may need 20 shillings to make a pound. And then this kind of devolves into eventually the adoption, ironically enough, of the Spanish dollar as our as our national really? currency. Oh, really? Um, yeah, the dollar is actually when a is Spanish that? currency. Um, that is actually, I want to say, in the 1790s, I think, mm -hmm. is when that Later, gets Later, because they were still talking in pounds, in terms of yeah, pounds. They're still, yeah, they're still talking in pounds. But even then, <coughs> each colony is defining pounds as separate. Like, it's mm -hmm. it's very weird. Um, so a pound in Massachusetts is not a pound in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, but even then, 90 pounds a year is enough to keep up a large estate mm -hmm. with multiple children and a wife and two servants. So that's something that you do have to keep in mind um, when you're, you know, when you're when you're talking about this and it's like, oh, well, he was barely able to entertain, but he was able to entertain. Mm -hmm. um, his son went to Harvard and, and to kind of just... To just kind of let people know how odd that is, most people didn't go to school at all. Mm -hmm. And the reason you didn't is because you couldn't take time off from subsistence farming or whatever your occupation was mm -hmm. because you needed every hand on deck just to survive. Yeah. And so that is the disconnect between Samuel Adams as the least of an aristocracy. Mm -hmm. Just because he's the least of an aristocracy mm -hmm. does not mean he is any less of an aristocrat. Yeah. And yes, he is, like, he. the thing is, is that, and this is something that is actually pretty well known about Sam Adams, he kind of relished in his poverty. And, and, and Stacey Schiff even brings this up, mm -hmm. is that he, he relishes in it because he adopted it as part of his identity. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that he was the same as a pig farmer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That does not mean that he was the same or had the same power mm -hmm. as your average Joe trying to just make ends meet in the countryside of Massachusetts because he is not. And that is something that I think people would make people very uncomfortable to realize about their founding fathers mm -hmm. is there is a land of gentry. Mm -hmm. George Washington was one of them. Sam Adams himself is one of them. John mm -hmm. Adams is one of them. And that is so odd for people to think about because of the way the Revolutionary War is almost always framed mm -hmm. as Big Britain versus tiny America. Farmers with pitchforks. Yeah, yeah. farmers with pitchforks, I right. I mean, really what you have sometimes is the further kind of obscenity of them comparing their condition under Britain to slavery. And yeah, such. and prior, prior know, to when, starting to record the mm -hmm. podcast, Michaela brought that up. Right. So yeah. you want to go into further on that? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll touch on your, your note first. I did think that the whole thing was glossed over just by her saying quite, I think maybe three or four times, um, especially when they were talking about assembly, there's more people that can vote. Mm -hmm. So they're talking about inviting the masses in, right? But these masses are not landowning and that they cannot vote. So yeah. I feel like that's the only area that I really saw that alluded to that aristocracy mm -hmm. being in place. Um, but other than that, it was relatively glossed over and you would really have to listen for or listen or like read intently to yeah. know that that's what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, cause obviously more than just the people who historically couldn't vote, like women, children, um, you know, were, weren't able to, right. um, weren't able to really have a say. And that would really be the only way for them to convey any sort of opinion would be in public. Right. In, in like a public forum. Yeah. Or, um, or hanging an effigy in the Liberty Tree, as it yeah, were. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and those things were even kind of attributed to the aristocracy, right? Like, they say, oh, these are the people that did it, but behind the scenes, it was Sam Adams who was mm -hmm. kind of calling the shots. Yeah. Um, but as far as the term slave, the term slavery was used quite often um, to describe the condition under the different acts, right? Like the Stamp Act 
Hold on. Let, let me let me just clarify something. Stacy Schiff is not the one using this no, language. Yes. It is actually the people of the time period using this language because I, I definitely wanted to make sure. Yes. Yeah, it's it, not her. Yeah. She's quoting others. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, it was more the use of the word at the time when slavery, like they were actually buying, were selling. There, there were slaves. Um, I think Sam Adams they talked for a time about him no, selling one. He There's, actually, mm-hmm. uh, I think he inherited some slaves. Okay. But he actually found the practice to be repugnant. And that okay. is actually something I do like about the guy. Okay. Uh, he found the practice to be repugnant. And, like, the second he inherited them, he immediately freed them. That's like okay. a single sentence. In the yeah. Book. Really? Yeah, she says yes. Oh, I thought it mentioned that he He, he inherited, but he someone. did not keep them. Okay. Um, he, he did free them. He okay. found slavery to be utterly repugnant, mm-hmm. um, which I think is maybe, to your point, mm-hmm. might be the reason he brings it up so often, uh-huh. because he he mm-hmm. is also mm-hmm. one of the people that wanted to, and, and this, I gotta give, I got it. like, I, I'm gonna, I've spent a lot of time bashing good old Sam Adams <laughs> uh, this, this, this trip, but... I am going to give him this. I'm going to give him this prop. He tried to get slavery abolished mm-hmm. in seven in in the 1770s. Mm-hmm. He okay. tried. He tried to actually enumerate that in the Bill of Rights. Mm-hmm. And uh, people are like, and and of course, mostly folks from the South, um, unfortunately, um, in the in the big slaveholding states, basically said that's never going to get ratified if you if you keep harping on that. Mm-hmm. And and that's why it was actually removed from the Bill of Rights. But Sam Adams was one of the people that was trying to get that enumerated because he found it so disgusting. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I, I'm going to have to give him props where props are due. And yeah, it's, it's it, yeah, that's, he tried to do that. Like he found slavery utterly repugnant. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he, he, that, that's something I think that's one of the reasons mm-hmm. why he's bringing it up is because I think he also wants people to, he's like, this is bad. And mm-hmm. I want you to associate it with the British who are also bad. You know, this... See, that that's what seemed like a stretch to me. But yeah. I guess I, from you explaining that, I guess I can understand that a little bit more. Because I saw one, you know, use of the word as such a huge atrocity. Right. And then the other as just him being kind of... Right. Yeah, melodramatic with his language. Mm-hmm. Um, I no, mean, no, no, no. He, he was using his language in a very pointed way. Yeah. Uh, but it's because he himself found slavery... So disgusting. Yeah. Like that, but, and, and he was trying to convince, it's kind of like fighting an uphill battle. He's trying to convince the wider colonial world that it's also bad when even many of his colleagues, like uh, John Hancock, mm-hmm. owned a lot of slaves and mm-hmm. did not disagree with it. And, you know, did not, and of course you, you saw how badly they disagreed with one another. Mm-hmm. So that's the thing is Sam Adams is trying to use that influence, that that propaganda to propagandize slavery being bad. And mm-hmm. it, to his credit, it does become an undercurrent through the rest of U.S. history. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, good job, Sam. You, you, you did that. You did good. You tried. Um, it seems to be one of the reasons she, cho- uh, you know, Schiff chose him as a subject and so oh, yeah. him without overstating the point. In right. The point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and, <clears throat> to, and to Stacey Schiff's credit, um, she actually, she, I think she picked him Partially because she picks, it seems like she picks her biographical focus, focuses because she's written a biography on Samuel Adams. She's written a biography on Cleopatra. And mm-hmm. I tell you, those two people <laughs> and researching those two people could not be yes. further apart, like could not be <laughs> more remotely different. Yeah. So she picks people, I think, that idealize their moment in history. Mm-hmm. You know, I also, Sam Adams being a really good example of that. Go ahead. I listened to a little interview with her where she does say, um, I suppose it was the witch's book she was working on, mm-hmm. um, and she came across some quotations from Samuel Adams, and she realized that she herself is from the town of Adams, Massachusetts, this and knew him. very mm-hmm. little about the figure mm-hmm. Samuel Adams, and that really bugged her, and mm-hmm. it seemed that... That's I don't know if she mentioned that of... in these pages, but... But oh, okay. I think that was what I was listening to. But uh, she does uh, mention that mm-hmm. um, that bug drew her to her research. Okay. All right. So we but, have been going on for a while. So <laughs> you guys, uh, any final thoughts? Yeah. Final thoughts to wrap up. Yeah. By way of a final thought, um, I was thinking about what you were saying a while back 
Rachel about maybe a weakness being an emphasis on Samuel Adams and Thomas Hutchinson and mm-hmm. it seeming like mm-hmm. the revolutionary is just about their conflict. And so I was thinking about, you know, the book's location in Boston and the kind of Boston-centric story we're getting here. <laughs> and I was thinking while reading it, man, I really would <clears throat> perhaps prefer to read about uh, these events not only through the lens of Samuel Adams, who there's a lot of missing historical information Mm -hmm. about, but rather like maybe a chapter about this person, a chapter about that person, a chapter about things from this colony's perspective, Mm -hmm. from, you know, things in Philadelphia, things in New Mm -hmm. York, Mm -hmm. uh, things in Virginia, you know, but maybe at the same time, the idea of a book like this is to get you interested more broadly to go out and read more, you know, perspectives and such about that topic and so in that sense maybe it making me want something more like that is just a call to go out and read more about the revolution Mm -hmm. there you go i think no more job for you (laughs) yeah awesome about you um i want to go back to boston (laughs) (laughs) it's a cool city it's got a lot of really cool history that um i was in philadelphia last year and we did a lot of you know walking around and looking at i don't know everywhere it felt like Ben Franklin ever stood. Um, <laughs> and uh, we were in a church that he and his family had been members of, and we we're speaking to the some of the people that worked preserving the church, and they were saying that, like, Philadelphia historically had a huge chip on its shoulder as being, like, not as good as Boston because oh, no. <laughs> Boston is, like, this wealthy, amazing, incredibly, like, cosmopolitan city in the colonies, and Philadelphia is, like, nothing relative to that. So... Um, through the lens of Ben Franklin, like he's from Boston and Boston is doing all this stuff to like, Jokes you know, because New um, York City exists now. <laughs> yeah. But like the point was essentially that like Boston is celebrating like Boston's son, Benjamin Franklin. And like, what did Philadelphia do? Nothing. And then that's when Philadelphia <laughs> starts to do more to celebrate mm-hmm. him. So mm-hmm. like the to Jeremy's point, the the not interpersonal, but inter like colonial uh, conflicts and things. It is interesting. Mm-hmm. And I. Anyway, it was a really interesting whole thing. And then um, to your point about the Founding Fathers being incredibly wealthy, if you ever get the chance to go to Monticello, they they give you a tour, like, standing outside of his house, and they point to this hill way off in the distance, okay, and they on. say... Hold on, guys. Uh, Monticello is the home place of Thomas Jefferson. Okay, go right. ahead. They say Thomas Jefferson lived here, obviously, but he was born over there, way off, and he, when he was born, he owned this like what you see is what he owned and it really everything the light touches it, literally it's oh. a really effective way of saying like these are not normal people these mm-hmm. are incredibly wealthy incredibly well-to-do people he's born and he has like x many slaves and he, he just anyway it's mm-hmm. it's really effective so if you do get the chance in like american history there's a lot if you go a little further north than florida that's worth seeing um oh, yeah so all that to say this book was not for me Maybe there will be a different book that's a little bit lighter. I felt like this book was just really dense, Mm -hmm. um, which made it hard for me. Mm -hmm. But other than that, um, I don't know. It was fine, you know, for a book I didn't finish. (laughs) (laughs) What do you think, Uh, Michaela? My final thoughts, I think, on it were I enjoyed that it allowed me to have a different perspective on politics of today, Mm -hmm. right? Like, I feel like she brought up a lot of... Very topics, very relevant topics that we look at today and we might even see as embarrassing topics today, right? His like History doesn't repeat, it rhymes. Yeah, it, it does. Exactly. <laughs> it does rhyme. So I feel like there's a lot of a lot of things that can be synonymous with the things that we're dealing with today. And that is interesting to see that repeating because it's not something, I guess you get the idea that because <laughs> these people are in black and white in your head, they act a different way. But people kind of always acted the same way. So it's nice to see that at least, right? Like, it's Mm -hmm. nice to see that comparison that these people that we put up on such high pedestals, right, as the writers of our Constitution, um, were dealing with the things that we do deal with today. And it's not as trivial as maybe we would think. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I I did enjoy it. It was a little bit difficult to get get through. It, Like I said, it was a marathon. Um, But... It, I, I'm not, I'm not mad that I read it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, my final thoughts, I actually really enjoyed this book, but then again, I also read the Cimmerillion cover to cover Mm -hmm. in one day. Don't, don't do that. Um, but I like dense books. So the fact that 
the fact of the density of this book actually did not deter me. I actually really enjoyed that. I also liked all of the little footnote asides. I like the end notes. I like the density of information in the book. Um, I also like how she frames everyone in the book as human. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I have my critiques, uh, but, the, but the thing is, is that the things that I critique about this book are not sins commit, are not unusual sins. They are sins committed by everybody that writes about the Revolutionary War period. Mm -hmm. um, unless they are actively trying to frame the Founding Fathers as being bad, which actually, uh, Stacey Schiff actually does bring up very, very briefly. Um, because there was a stint in around, like, the 1870s-ish, mm -hmm. where American authors uh, tried to frame the Founding Fathers as being maybe a, a little bit psycho. And it was because we were getting back into good graces with Britain at that time. Mm -hmm. And so it was basically, like, it, it had been gung-ho, patriot, flag-waving, and then it went completely in the opposite direction in the pendulum as, you know, World War I started happening and World War II started happening. The pendulum started swinging back the other direction to that rah-rah, mm -hmm. you know, 4th of July, shooting off fireworks kind of thing. Nothing unites like an enemy? Yeah, oh, yeah, nothing yeah. unites like an enemy. But that's the thing is that it's, uh, I, I, I do not recommend this book. As someone who, who has studied history for a very long time, I don't recommend this book as a source. Not, not, do not use this book as a source. But if you're wanting to, if you, if you like dense books and you, you think you would enjoy learning more about Sam Adams, I do recommend this as a fun read. If it, but it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not like a croissant, it's dense like a pound cake. So if you like pound cake, then there you go. Um, I mean, dense books on a topic someone's really interested right. in tend to be great. But yeah. the other thing, the too, Hermione is that... Hermione Granger, a bit of light reading quote comes right. to mind. Mm -hmm. But the other thing, too, is that the Selected Bibliography is actually a really handy starting point. Yeah, I was going to say. Uh, mm -hmm. A really handy starting point, so kind of like the way you would never use Wikipedia as a source. Don't use this as a source, but definitely use it as a jumping off point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it is very good for that purpose, and definitely listen to the audiobook, guys. It is a treat, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are my final thoughts. So, now we get to the review section. All of, right. So, of the program. we took some wonderful one-star reviews just to get a good round opinion of the book that we have going on today. Um so, I I don't know, should I say their names? We have a a Miss Joan who says, "Terrible book. I actually didn't finish it." But I did get to page 163 and decided I had had enough. Um, so Joan, unfortunately, was not for her. Mm -hmm. um, but the funniest one was the, I'm also pretty one sure. Also one-star review. Also one-star review was the Gen Z review that I captured off of Goodreads is, this was low-key the worst book I've ever read, <laughs> which I think is a little bit unfair. That is pretty unfair, yeah. That, that is pretty unfair. And then the last one, which is also extremely funny, I got off of Amazon, which is, Googled synonyms to describe boring. The author loves obscure synonyms. This book gave me flashbacks of 12th grade history and why I hated studying history in school. I really, really, all capitals, tried. I took notes, I looked up words, and I gave up. Um, so those are, those are some of the poor reviews. Of course, there's ones that go much more in depth. A lot of them just say that the language is a little bit too flouncy. Is that yeah, the right I, word? I would uh, I would agree with that. It's very uh, flowery. Yeah, flowery is the right word. How often she uses the word Rubicon or yes. the cross? Mm -hmm. The Rubicon had been crossed. You know, I think it's because I think it's because there there is so much reference to that in mm -hmm. the the manuscripts in that the she's literature. actually yeah. studying. So yeah, that probably <laughs> that's probably why. Um, one of my okay. neighbors has a dog named Rubicon, so it's ceased really? to be like a normal word and is simply a dog. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, it's also a type which, of car. Like, yeah, it's a, yeah, it just makes it, when um, you come across it in a book, I, I'm always like, oh, wait, no, that's an actual, that has a different meaning. It's yeah. not just this pimple mix. <laughs> <laughs> very, very funny. But the, re the reviews, there are some very funny reviews. If you want to look up more, I think that's about all we have time for today. 
Um, but I will leave you with one five-star review that says, most people don't understand the significant impact Samuel Adams had on our revolution. And I think that that's probably one of the best things that could be said about yeah. this, right? Like, yeah. in Before simple I terms. Read this, I thought he was just a beer. Yep. Well, I knew it was more than a beer, but Jeremy mostly don't knew about like the that. beer. Don't, don't, don't hurt me like that, man. Um, <laughs> I actually don't know how much I knew he was more than a beer. <laughs> I'm I mean, not going to lie. I could talk for two The beer hours, kept but... his name alive. Yeah. So there's that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Sorry, All right. And I, bet you John, and I bet you John, his cousin, would be real salty about that. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah was waiting that whole hour just to say that. Yeah. <laughs> and that has been our Librarian's Choice book club review of the revolutionary Samuel Adams. Be sure to join us in September for our next Librarian's Choice episode, which will feature The 90s by Chuck Klosterman, hosted by our very own Jeremy Zorn.